Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last session of WolfCon today. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, this session is on control digital lending, and we're very excited about it. Um, we are recording, just as a reminder. Um, there's transcript is below, and you can enable that by clicking on the show transcript under the live transcript button. Uh, we're using the Q&A feature for questions, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and you can type those in anytime. Um, and we're using the hashtag WolfCon21 for um, social media. So um, please feel free to live tweet the session. And with that, I'll pass it over to, um, uh, to the presenters today. So thank you all. Kyle, you up first. Absolutely, thanks everyone. I was just clicking on the bottom here. Uh, my name is Kyle Courtney. Uh, I am Copyright Advisor out of uh, Harvard Library. Uh, and I'm very excited here to talk, to frame the discussion that I hope will be um, very interactive. And we welcome Q&A, of course, uh, about uh, controlled digital lending resource sharing. Um, I'm going to display a few slides. I know slides aren't everyone's favorite, um, but it will keep me on point and keep me within the time limits um, because I tend to to talk, as everyone here on this panel probably knows very well. Uh, so let me just get this going here. And there's my Zoom slide. And there we go. Um, so, oops. <laughs> So if you haven't heard about controlled digital lending yet, here's your chance to be updated uh, in a way that I think reflects uh, the realities of this scenario. Um, and, and basically, controlled digital lending is a simple premise uh, that actually had its origins a decade ago with the beginnings of Internet Archive's Open Libraries program. Um, and even before that, Michelle Wu's initial article uh, when she was at Georgetown Law about creating a, a, a lendable digital library. Uh, and then Dave Hansen and I wrote uh, the white paper in 2018. Uh, and the premise is, is that it's merely replicating something that already exists in many cultural institutions, libraries, and archives. The ability for you to loan those materials continually without paying again and again to the copyright holder. Only now you're doing this very basic and fundamental thing in the throes of what we refer to as the digital environment online, right? So meeting the users where they are in the digital space, utilizing the underpinnings of libraries freedom to loan. Now the library's freedom to loan comes from two different types of places, whether or not it's electronic access or physical access to these works. One of them here is the fair use statute. I'm not going to do a lecture on fair use, although I would be delighted to, um, but that's an underlying opinion that, hey, there are certain things I may be able to do, right? And these opinions have been rendered through statutory uh, interpretation and case law and says criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. These are the limited things in which we don't think uh, you need to pay an additional fee or get permission from the copyright holder. Combine that with the underpinnings of a library's ability to loan, which is referred to often as first sale, which says notwithstanding the bundle of rights that's owned by the copyright owner, the owner of a copy can loan this without permission. Now, this is how uh, many of our libraries have loaned thousands and thousands of books um, many, many times, hundreds, if not tens of thousands of times, without getting permission again, again, once they have legally acquired that work. So if we took that narrative and we baked it into this premise of why can't libraries enter that space, the digital space, which libraries have been in for a long time, um, and replicate that. Uh, and so the white paper here, which is available uh, in this uh, uh, bit.ly, as you can see here, um, and we have an updated publication coming in this year uh, because there's been some more case law that we think helps aid the interpretation of this statement. Um, but this should be, I think, something that when we wrote it in 2018 wasn't necessarily incredibly controversial, though some people disagreed. Uh, but the last 15 months, I think, have proven the necessity for something um, like controlled digital lending being able to replicate that library loan period. And, and again, I, I break this down very simply. Um, this should be a familiar system to everyone. You know, a, a library or cultural institution acquires a copy. It is then checked out to one person at a time for a limited time period, right, usually the checkout period, and then it is returned to that person. 
And then it is made available to the next person on the list, right, or the queue. And then you repeat this process. You repeat this process over and over and over. And it's something that we kind of take for granted, right? But this is framed uh, in, in, uh, through the lens of both fair use and, and for sale, that concept that I can make these things available. And in this entire time, I'm not seeking permission from the copyright holder. I'm not paying an additional fee. I could loan this over and over. Now, how do we translate this ability, obviously, to the digital space? Because the, the problem, certainly, in the digital environment is I did guess the best of what's available with the internet, right? Replication um, and all this other process that, that occurs um, that technology takes benefit of, right? It's easier to copy. It's easier to cut and paste and all this. Well, then we, we had to create a framework that said, okay, we're going to mimic that which exists in the physical using the lens of fair use and first sale and then convert that to the digital. And we came up with this kind of methodology, which is a combination of technology, fair use and first sale. So first, we start with the idea that these works are acquired lawfully, right? These are works that you are purchasing. And it's very important that we distinguish here the difference between works that are owned and works that are licensed. Um, certainly, the majority of ebook collections are not owned in the sense where a traditional notion of physical ownership occurs, right? If I own, lend a book to someone else, that other ha person has to wait until that book comes back. In the digital space, um, sometimes we refer to this as friction, right? There's friction. Well, what if we could do this and replicate that friction? And you need to be able to own these works in order to replicate that particular friction. Um, and so it's important that we are not licensing these materials, we are owning them. And that puts it back into collections that are generally we have ownership rights over in print, but we can talk more about that. So then you limit the number of copies that you have in circulation to the, the ones that you have physically, right? And we call this the own to loan ratio, the concept that you cannot duplicate more than you own. Again, replicating the loan period that exists in the physical. And then you lend each person to a single person at a time, just as a physical copy would be. And then you limit that time period, obviously, that's parallel to whatever your uh, environment is for physical lending, two weeks, 30 days, three hours, depending on it's a reserves item or another item. And then, you know, the part that's not everyone's favorite, but we use digital rights management to prevent wholesale copying redistribution. And, and we, we do that uh, simply because if you did send a PDF to a user, they could replicate it hundreds of times and, and you might be liable for this. So if there's a, there's a way to kind of use that, I, I've been described this as putting the glass slipper on the foot that we have um, for the fairy tale narrative. And so the combination of all these methods we think lowers the risk. But one other key component of this is also, and this is my very crude and I apologize, a diagram of CDL methodology, is that the physical copy, the one in which you have made this digital loanable copy, that has to be hidden away somewhere. Right? That could be in a locked office, in a salt mine. It could be off campus in a large repository. Uh, that is entirely up to you. We've even talked about what if you made a digital copy and destroyed the original work. Now, I'm not here to talk about destroying books. Um, but nevertheless, that idea is that it becomes inaccessible. And that is critical to the, 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 the CDL uh, program in that you know, you're not distributing. So again, you loan this to users with, with technological limits. No copying, no downloads, limited duration, no permanent copy retained. And maybe in your risk analysis, the CDL welcomes uh, a whole methodology of different types of uh, CDL flavors. You're careful for market harm. You're, you're looking if there's pre-existing licensing for, for some works. Maybe you're focusing on orphan works or works in which have a limited licensing market. Now, all of these things are designed to lower the risk for the library and keep it relatively low compared to what we perceive of as the high risk in not making these materials available. We are unearthing potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands of works that never made the jump to digital as it is, but they're sitting there on library shelves. And much like probably many of your students or my students, it doesn't exist unless it's online in many capacities, but it also has numerous benefits. And, and by the way, libraries are very well involved in this space already. This is something that I talk about frequently. We've already been doing electronic document delivery. We've already been doing interlibrary loan. Many of us are experimenting with virtual reading rooms or listening rooms, right? Control digital lending is just one of the arrows in the quiver of tools that libraries are capable of using to increase 
access to these works to users. And, and we're using, in, in many cases, the same exact technology uh, that many vendors and publishers use to lock down distribution on, on, on their eBooks and their collections as well. So we're, we're not outside the norm here. Um, this is legally acquired works um, that we had a right to loan in some capacity. We're just moving that to the digital space. And again, I'd like to say that this has been done and libraries have been the best at loaning and providing access to materials, both physical and digital, uh, you know, since the digital age began. Now, this has been taken up uh, in many places. I, I, as of my count currently, there are over 100 libraries and publishers that have harnessed some CDL system to loan or provide access to digital copies. Um, and these are just a few that I'm naming here because they're brief with Boston Public Library, the Allen County did their genealogical collection, which is brilliant. That's one of the most sought after things in libraries and archives. Um, Georgetown Law Library has been doing this for a number of years though. MIT libraries, MIT Press actually has some of their selected back catalog online. And Houghton Mifflin Harcourt actually lost, no joke, their back catalog. <laughs> and thankfully a library held on to it and they agreed to digitize and make that back catalog available. You know, stuff from the 40s, 50s and 60s. And this shows us that kind of the, the balance that I'm, that I'm thinking CDL does the best at. Um, it preserves the mission of libraries and the power of the print, right? That concept that who else is gonna save this except for cultural institutions whose mission it is to save it. You know, any of the vendors, publishers, author estates, et cetera, that could be the next Lehman Brothers. We don't know if they'll go belly up. Um, controlled digital lending serves that preservation purpose, but it also serves that access purpose because all of these libraries are surfacing thousands of works that may have not gotten in the hands of their users, but especially during the pandemic when we became so desperate to get access to something that was electronic, that could provide safe and reliable access to the materials. And, and what is more safe and reliable than your local public library? Um, so that was at least uh, my initial discussion in to, to kind of frame some of these issues for us. Um, I'm going to pass it over now to, actually, I don't know who's next, I apologize. Um, I'm gonna take Steven. it from here, Kyle. Great, yep. Stephen, thank yep. you so much. You are welcome, thank you for that. That was a great introduction. Um, so I'm Stephen Davison. I'm head of digital library development at Caltech, and I'm joined here with my by my colleague uh, Michael Hucker, and uh, we're going to give you a brief description of our implementation of uh, a CDL system, um, really just as a point um, for discussion. So let me share my screen, and the purpose of the first slide is. Um, Primarily to acknowledge um, the contributions of two of our colleagues, Robert Doyle and, and Tommy Keswick. Robert did the uh, shibboleth part of this and the, and the server part, and Tommy did all the IIIF work. So I'm going to do uh, an intro to this, and then Mike's going to give you a bit more of the technical details. So um, our system, digital um, borrowing system at Caltech, was born out of the pandemic, like a lot of other people's work, and um, we have implemented it to manage uh, digital reserves. So we digitize books, we make them available through this system for reserve purposes only at the moment. And our work was inspired to, to some extent by what Princeton did and what, what Brown did. Um, and we have released all of the code um, on GitHub, so it's all available with, with a lot of documentation. So we had two primary aims. One was to meet our local needs, but also to build something that other people could use. So what does it do? Um, we adhere to the six, uh, to, to the requirements that Kyle outlined. It, it is a, uh, a true CDL compliant system. Um, it, the only thing that lacks that Kyle mentioned was a queuing system. We tried to make it as simple as possible um, and queuing would have made that a, a little bit more complicated. But the way we've built it is that we did not want to build anything that replicated anything that we already had. So we didn't want to replicate the, the catalog. We didn't want to replicate managing users or anything like that. Um, so we've built on the infrastructure that we have. Um, 
We keep the, the images that are on a local server. They're encoded using the IIIF and delivered using the IIIF protocol. The IIIF is a standard. It's the uh, interna International Interoperability uh, Image Framework. And it's a means by which images can be distributed um, across a network, across the internet, um, in very, very flexible ways. Um, and we use the universal viewer for, uh, for, the, for the actual user experience, and we use our local authentication system. So those are all completely independent of the DIBS part. The DIBS part really only implements the CDL component. The only connection with the catalog is, a, is an ID from the catalog. Um, it pulls in a very limited amount of bibliographic data, but we don't manage any bibliographic data in the system. We don't manage any user information in the system. It's just a user ID. It simply does the uh, traffic cop work, if you like, of implementing the controlled digital library system. Um, so very, very few dependencies. Um, and no replication of services. And the image management part is separate from the CDL component. And um, for instance, uh, you could use a completely different uh, image um, server than the one we use. You could use different uh, user authentication. You could use a different catalog. We currently have this linked to our Tind catalog, but we are migrating to Folio, so it will be integrated with Folio. By the, uh, by the time we bring that up in, in the fall. Um, the two things, the, the one thing which is a little bit different about this is that we don't have traditional um, digital rights management. The digital rights management piece is simply that the images cannot be downloaded. So you'd have to disable downloading. And also the URLs to those images are obfuscated. So users have no way of finding an operable, an actionable URL to those images. They can experience them, um, they can flip through the book, pan, et cetera, but they can't actually pull down the images themselves. Um, so before I hand off to Mike, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about where we could be going from here. Using IIIF, we could share, um, we, we, this could be, a IIIF server can share internationally. So you can have a IIIF server with these, um, with these books, digitized books, and make them available to anyone in, in the world across a network. Um, this doesn't have to be limited. This sort of system doesn't have to be limited to, um, to copyrighted material. We could be sharing personally or culturally or uh, sensitive information or work works which are sensitive in some other legal way rather than just simple copyright. So the, the controlled in CDL could be controlling all sorts of other things besides uh, copyrights and, and um, intellectual property um, a, as we currently think of it. Um, and we could share, be, be sharing other things other than books. We could have home movies in special collections. So we want to control access to for various reasons, but there's no reason not to share them. And there's a lot of material in special collections for which the provenance and, and the legal standing might be unknown or disputed. So you might want to control access for those sorts of things. So, so where we want to go with this is to build a system that, yes, does CDL as we might think of ILL right now, but also integrate well with the um, a special collections use case. I'm going to hand this off to Mike, who's going to give you a bit more of a technical orientation. Take it away, Mike. Thank you, Stephen. So I'm Mike Haka. I'm a research software developer at the Caltech Library. And hopefully you're seeing my, my window here. Um, I'm going to give you a demo of what the actual uh, system is like and what the user experience is like. This is the live running demo at Caltech, uh, the live system at Caltech, um, as people would see it, uh, as our students would see it um, uh, today. So we, um, first off, for authentication, we use what's called a single sign-on system. This is common to a lot of Caltech applications, and I think a lot of institutions um, have single sign-on systems as well. And basically, this, does, this is advantageous to us for two reasons. One is people are already familiar with this, so that they use the same credentials for different uh, uh, systems like Caltech. The other thing is, from the developer standpoint, for us as developers of the software, we didn't have to 
implement user security, user logons, that kind of thing. So this is authentication layer sits in front of dibs and um, handles all the user authentication piece. And all that dibs gets uh, really from it is an email address, which we use uh, both to find, to maintain information about who's actively uh, got a borrowed book out and also to send them email with some information once they check something out. So I'm just going to log in as any user would to the system. And um, and that goes on to the uh, web server serving dibs. Now, we have currently two kind of divergent use cases in mind. One is the patron or the student who's who wants to see uh, read material. We assume that that person is given uh, direct links to the relevant materials for a particular class, perhaps in a class syllabus or via class mailings or something like that. So um, they would receive like a URL somewhere that would tell them the particular items that they can um, uh, go to for whatever purpose for the class. So I'm just going to go to one such page describing an item. Um, this is, uh, whoops, one of the there should be an image preview, which is apparently very slow right now. Um, so this is the kind of information a person would see. The um, uh, it's limit as you can see. There's limited metadata, just enough information to identify uh, the book to the user. And uh, as I said, there should be a little screenshot of the cover and a button to get uh, a loan out. Now um, there's also a reminder of how much, how long a loan can be. Each item in the system can be given a duration uh, individually. So a lot of our items are uh, listed for three hour loans, but they could be more, um, one hour or 24 hours or whatever is necessary, whatever the course instructors and the librarians think is appropriate for that item. And uh, this is the simplest, basically, you can see it's very simple because we're trying to make it as simple as we could. A person would then say, click to uh, the button to get a loan. Um, there's a dialogue that is presented and I'm told on Zoom it doesn't show up. So if you don't see a dialogue right now, you have to trust me that there is actually a little dialogue that I'm seeing at the moment. And it's just a reminder of, uh, it's just a confirmation, okay, start the loan right now, tells them uh, how long the duration is. And if I click it through, I am sent to the viewer. This is uh, the universal viewer. It's an off the shelf open source viewer for triple if and uh it's i'm sure it's familiar to anyone who's used an electronic book viewer of some kind where you have a list of thumbnails and pages uh, an area where you see the book um, you can also jump to individual um, pages directly there's also an overview map where you can see uh, uh, all the pages and then if you click on something you can zoom in and pan around um, and basically uh, experience uh, the book as it is. This is a scanned book. So these are images. IIIF tiles the images. That's why the, the, the zooming is very smooth. Um, and as Stephen mentioned, all of these images, so what we've done in configuring the IIIF universal viewer is to disable downloads. The other thing we do is pipe all of the image requests through dibs. So dibs acts as a traffic cop and even if a user is able to uh, look in their browser and see what the URL is, the URL they'll get goes through dibs. And since dibs knows whether that user has uh, loaned out an item, has borrowed an item, uh, then it can either allow them to view an image or not allow them. So if a random, if you were to save this and you didn't actually save the URL and didn't actually check out a book, went back to it at some time, later you wouldn't be able to access it it wouldn't give you the data and if you were uh, especially crafty and you wanted to do something like uh, grab the pieces out of your browser you would get individual image tiles which is really uh, not very helpful from the same point of, of uh, trying to bypass the security so we we try to make it as as uh, as robust as we could the other thing we did with the universal viewer is um, provide some information in the upper left for when the loan ends and an explicit end loan button. A person could just let it time out, but if they're done with it, it's nice for the next person to uh, just end it early. There's another dialogue and I think you probably can't see it, but it's just 
a request for confirmation. Do you really want to end it now? I click yes, and I'm sent to a page that says thanks, and maybe a, a reminder to maybe send us feedback. If I go back to the page, um, it now tells me that I can't loan it out again, even though I just ended the loan. We have a cooling off period. Um, it's set for, for us, it's set to 15 minutes, but that's configurable. And the basic idea is you don't, uh, we don't allow people to just borrow it, end it, borrow it, end it, borrow it without letting anybody else, uh, uh, without giving anybody else a chance to, to uh, check out a, an item. Um, as Steven said, we don't have a queuing system. So this really replicates kind of the physical experience of going to the library, checking to see if the book is there, uh, if it's not uh, coming back later, basically. Uh, in our case, we tell them when it's scheduled to be available, uh, either because they had just borrowed and they're waiting for the cooling off period or somebody else has it, when does that person's um, uh, thing end? Now, that's the patron experience. Uh, for staff, there's an additional couple of pages. Um, just to be mindful of time, I won't spend too much time on this, but one page um, in the system, uh, by the way, I should say, um, <clears throat> I'm able to access those because it recognizes me as having the role of a staff person, so I can access pages. Usual uh, sort of students and patrons wouldn't be able to see these pages because the system would know that this person doesn't have the role of a staff. But um, for staff users, uh, you have additional information, uh, additional capabilities. Um, to see what the items are, edit their loan durations and the number of copies available. Um, and then at the bottom, um, an, a simple form to add a new item. When our staff add items to this, they type in the barcode for the book that they're scanning, give it the loan duration and the number of copies they're taking off the shelves in order to make them available. We maintain strict uh, own to loan ratio. And in fact, our circulation staff physically uh, lock away the books that are made available. So if they take two books off the shelves, they actually physically lock it away uh, for real. Um, so they, so while those two books are available through dibs, let's say they are not available physically at all to be to be uh, loaned. And um, uh, what did I want to say about this? Uh, I forgot what I was going to say something else, but I forgot now. Anyway, um, uh, so you can see. Uh, uh, the, it's a fairly straightforward system. Oh, I know what I was going to say. The barcode, uh, you notice that we have additional information about the title and author. Um, the barcode is used to fetch that information from our ILS, which is currently tinned. Um, and if you were to take it to uh, the source code and want to use it for another institution, you might, if you're not using tinned, you probably want to change that bit of the code. But it's, it's, we made it, made that interface very, very narrow. So it's only, a very few lines of code um, to change that. And if you're interested in using that and doing it for another system and would like to work with us to make that change, I'd be happy to uh, help you figure out what uh, what to do to modify it. And that's basically the, the Dibs experience. Um, there's a page with some statistics about uh, loans, um, very straightforward, how many loans to date um, for each book. Uh, and uh, the average loan duration that the different items have seen. Okay, but that's basically it. And I, I don't want to take too much time, uh, so uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, and I think uh, I I could talk a little bit more about the architecture, but I'm concerned we're we're running short on time. So I think I should either turn it over to Sebastian or. Um, well, I guess I am. So I think it's uh, your turn, Sebastian. All right. Thanks, Mike. And I will try to be brief just to leave time for uh, for questions and discussion. Um, I wanted to just uh, uh, finish up by talking about some conversations that we've had in, um, in ReShare over the course of the past, last year, year and a half during the pandemic, essentially about um, taking the abstraction uh, the abstract notion of CDL that's defined in the white paper, which is wonderful and, and exciting in many ways, but looking at what it might be like to take that abstraction and, and turn it into um, an actionable system that, that functions more sort of aligned with the way that a library practices resource access in general. There are at this point hundreds of different implementations of, of CDL around the country 
Korea and around the world. They've exploded during the pandemic, obviously. What the vast majority of them have in common is that they sit somewhat outside of the, the mainstream uh, library management system and the main flows and processes of resource access. What that means is typically that either um, you limit the use of them to things like uh, course reserves, or you limit them to emergency situations where access to the library is entirely shut down, as has been the case for the, the Internet Archive Service and for Haji Trust during the pandemic, or you, you kind of apply CDL sometimes as a last step before weeding materials that you're not really sure that you want to keep anymore you might donate them to the internet archive and, and and they can circulate them digitally we we were asking ourselves what might it look like for cdl to be just another way to get at material and something that could be managed within the library management system that you, you could apply policies and rules to uh workflows to and that you could apply into library lending to it I'll take a look and we really discussed it from a perspective of, of, of Project Reshare because Reshare has a lot of the knobs and levers and mechanisms to talk to a library management system, to talk to the catalog, to determine whether material is on the shelf, to, to check it out, to send, send notices, notices to staff. Um, but I would like to kind of challenge you or encourage you to think about this also from the perspective of what could Folio do as a system that, into, that, that implemented CDL as a native function? What are the opportunities that we might have to do CDL in a, in a better, richer way if we implemented this functionality more deeply in the, in the ILS? As much as there are huge benefits to having a system that is independent of the ILS, I think that there's also some huge benefits to, to bringing things more on board. And some of those integration points and processes might look like your, your loan rules, your policies, it will be really neat, I think, to be able to pull those policies into the way that you describe policies for circulation in general, so that you can tweak and tune them depending on your, your level of risk tolerance. Um, uh, as, as Kyle said, uh, you want to be able to manage, of course, your, your, your management of your own to loan ratio so that you can circulate things physically or digitally as the case might be, so that when things are checked out digitally, at that point, you make it unavailable for physical access until the, the digital copy is returned and so on. Um, you want to be able to tune that kind of functionality depending on whether your stacks are open or closed. Um, if the stacks are closed, you don't have to do anything physically. Um, and you want to be able to support physical workflows, sending somebody to take material off the shelf, kicking off a scanning process or sending material out for scanning on demand if that's how things are done in your organization. Um, and you want to support integrations with different types of delivery pipelines, DIM solutions, and reader software, and so on. Um, all these are, are, are things that you could realize if you start to think about CDL as something that is more deeply integrated into how the library has done its, does its business. And again, we had thought about multiple different paths where one could be reshare as kind of a CDL in a box that might be connected to multiple different ILSs, library management systems. But, but I really do think that there are some interesting opportunities if you think about doing this inside a folio. Um, and finally, I think the reason to think about doing this is I think that it's critically important that right now we are in a place when it comes to CDL where it's new. It hasn't yet found its form. It has been implemented ad hoc in a lot of different organizations. Uh, we have tried in a collaboration between Project Reshare and Stanford Libraries and with the help of Kyle as well to set up an implement an implementers group to talk about kind of different approaches to help find best practices. But by and large, people are kind of doing CDL on their own and it hasn't found its real shape yet. And my concern is that if we don't have a community process if we as a community don't take ownership well then the vendors will end up defining what cdl is and how, how it works and because at the moment xlibris is the largest vendor ultimately it may well mean that xlibris gets to define what cdl is and how it works and i'm sure that they would do a fine job at it but i also would like to see a wider community have a say um so all this means that I think that there are great reasons for, for us as a community to think about 
what CDL looks like from a technical perspective and from a workflow and resource access perspective. And there are some real opportunities here to flesh that out. But I wanted to end by just kind of fleshing out or, or exploring a little bit what the, what the intersection of interlibrary loan and resource sharing and uh, CDL looks like, because I think it's pretty exciting. Um, this is kind of a, a really crude diagram of how resource sharing looks without CDL in the picture, how, how Resia does things. You've got a patron coming to a library, the library doesn't have the material that the patron wants, um, so that library sends a request to another library, says, lend this material to me, and the library says, fine, here's the book. Uh, that's ILO. It's been done for, for a long time um, and is well understood. If we add in, um, and, and by the way, you know, Rishia does this with ISO ILL, uh, uh, which is important in terms of kind of openness and transparency, but that's, that's just how we've chosen to do things. Um, so if this is done, if we add CDL to the picture, we imagine a situation where the, the lending library has a copy of the book. They also have a digital file. Uh, the borrowing library comes in, says, can I borrow this? And the, uh, the, the lending library says, yes, here you go. Here's the digital file. It is yours for whatever number of hours or days that's applicable. And it's then up to the borrowing library here to apply DIM and provide this material to the, to the reader. Um, that's kind of the simple version of this. Um, more interesting is if you start to imagine a scenario where uh, the patron comes into a library that already happens to have a file corresponding to that book, but they don't have any more books. They don't have any more physical copies on the shelf. They're all out. What does the library do? If we imagine um, resource sharing and ILL extended into this realm, what the library can then do, go is use whatever discovery mechanism or index is in place to go and find a library that has a physical copy perhaps within its consortium and say, hey, I'd like to do a CDL lend of this book. I don't need the digital file, I already got it, but I need you to put this book aside for me so that I can lend it. I need you to sequester it um, on behalf of me. And the library can then do that. Um, if it's in closed stacks, nothing needs to happen physically. Uh, if it's in open stacks, the library needs to go take that book off the shelf and put it away and then go back and say, hey, you got it. Uh, you can now go and lend that material to your patron. So what we start to see is a picture where a network of libraries can collaborate to provide digital lending where different libraries might specialize. There may be libraries like the Internet Archives that has vast collections of digital copies of things, but not necessarily very many physical copies that can provide access to the digital files supported by a network of library that has ownership of these copies. You can see this kind of brought into the realm of thinking about uh, uh, the shared prints and print retention. How do you manage your collection across a group of libraries, both digitally and physically? Um, I think it creates a, a, a whole bunch of really interesting opportunities to, to optimize the delivery of library services across the network. And in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here and yield my last minute to Alan and uh, and to discussion. Um, thank you. So I wanted to, hi everyone. My name is Alan Jones. I'm the co-convener of the subject matter experts group within Project Reshare. Um, I work with a wonderful Kristen Wilson who can't be here, um, but I, I wanted to thank all of our panelists um, and. We've had a number of questions actually come in, but I wanted to um, also uh, bring some questions to bear as well. Um, first, starting with Kyle. Um, uh, Kyle, you claim to love all things Disney, um, and yet you you talk about sharing. Um, <laughs> uh, please explain your answer here. No, <laughs> in all seriousness. Um, how does the own alone version of, of CDL differ from what Internet Archive has done, first of all? And second of all, do you see uh, the owned alone ratio to be something that is institutionally defined, or do you see it as something to be network defined the way that Sebastian's talked? Sure. So, so we, we call this kind of the, by the way, I do go to Disney sometimes. You can love copyright and Disney at the same time. Um, the own to loan is a critical underpinning of making sure that you're not replicating and, and stepping into the area of infringement, right? So if this truly is a replication model for something that's well within the law, 
um, you need to maintain that owns alone because it couldn't happen in the physical space. Um, you couldn't give someone a book and then somebody else gets a ghost version of that book, right? That, that would be a copy. Um, Internet Archive does own all of the copies. Now they've acquired it by either donation, purchase, or, you know, a library closes, <laughs> and, you know, and it's willed to be quested to them. So, so they do, they have warehouses, warehouses of books. Um, and I think this is a model that we should look at because many of us here have libraries with offsite repositories and suddenly they have immense value. It also changes the idea of collection development. We used to dedupe, right? Let's, let's, let's throw out the books that we have doubles, triples, quadruples of. Wait a minute now, what if we could consortially loan all these versions of it? Uh, so, so, so I think there, there is a way to define it internally if we look at the, the methodologies that we saw our, our partners, uh, my co-panelists here present today. But I'm always thinking, and, and Sebastian has me thinking about this a lot lately, consortial models, right, where a lot of people throw in together. We already have that in existence, right? We have consortial models where we are sharing shared warehouses of print materials, like Recap does that, right? Um, and so as long as you have those, I don't think it needs to definitely be institutionally defined as opposed to defined from some other group. It can be either. These are kind of the many flavors of that. But it's critical that own to loan does remain. That's what, I, that's what I would say. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. So we have a, a question from Joshua Graven that, that's kind of a follow-up of this, which is, would the borrowing CDL library need to replicate this friction of the delay involved in physically sending the book, um, in, in, involved, uh, involved in physically sending the item? Yeah. So here's the good news. Copyright law does not protect friction. <laughs> right, it does not say, and this is the incredible gain. We we see that friction of physical. I got to go to the desk, and I got to wait for so and so to return. It's been three hours. Where's so and so? That's eliminated, right? If you could automate this with a system somehow, the next person could receive the delivery of the book instantaneously once that period is done. And copyright law does not protect friction. It's not divine. So this frictionless system has huge access uh, implications here, and that I think is. Um, the best part of, of, of some of what we're talking about here. Increasing access to materials, um, regardless of socioeconomic status, geography, location, connection to the library, it does all those things. And so I am anti-friction. <laughs> uh, so next question, you each have 30 seconds. If you could draft one NISO work item for CDL, where vendors and, and other projects had to, uh, um, had to agree upon a particular standard, what might it be? Would it be in the area of discovery? Would it be in the area of delivery, encryption? Start with Stephen. Uh, I'd say discovery. That, that, um, because if you don't have standardized discovery, then you can't discover stuff. I think we can have various encryptions. I think we can have uh, various other systems, but discovery. Michael? I guess I, coming from the implementation side of things and having gone through implementing DIBs, I'm feeling like delivery would be a good one to uh, standardize. If multiple systems are going to be communicating and allowing a person to access across institutional boundaries, then I think you have to figure out how you would do that. And so you would need a standard way um, hopefully an open standard <laughs> to, uh, to do that. Seb? I would go a little bit sideways and suggest vocabulary and, and reference modeling. Uh, um, one of the things we discussed in, in, in our conversations about the white paper was it would be really nice. Let's take the friction points as an example. We've got these variable friction points that you can introduce depending on how risk averse you are perhaps depending on the kind of library that you are, it would be useful to be able to, to capture those uh, and to describe your CDL policies in a way that would be, that would be shared and interoperable. Um, and, and you can think of other areas in terms of licensing, in terms of access rights, where I think it would be really useful to establish, establish shared nomenclature as an underpinning for implementation. So one final question, um we looks like we have time for um i'm curious 
uh, about uh, this difference between some of the some of the models that have pre been presented um, with respect to kind of uh, the the dibs model versus things like library simplified that are actually mobile specific. Um, have have you all thought about uh, the uh, the different types of distribution methods and whether whether that was something that was a good fit or not fit or or didn't fit within the Caltech and if you could talk a little uh, within Caltech and if you could talk a little bit about some of your reasoning around that and Seb if you want to talk about reshare a little bit as well so let me uh, let me just quickly clarify that actually the Although the system I just demonstrated, the viewer was, I did it on a desktop computer. It's actually mobile friendly. The IIIF um, viewer that we use, Universal Viewer, is a JavaScript uh, widget basically, and you can embed it in any web page. Um, and you can, and it's perfectly usable from a tablet or even a phone. Um, although the viewing experience on a small screen is kind of, you know, awkward, but uh, you can definitely do it. And we made sure that that works. Um, I think. So there's no limitation in terms of, um, of you know desktop versus uh, mobile for our system, and I think although mobile these days is becoming sort of the first line, where a lot of people would prefer to use maybe a tablet or something to to read a book. Um, for at least academics, if you're a student in a course, you I can see that you would often want to be able to view a a book or an item on your laptop or your computer while you're doing something else. Let's say you're working on a class assignment or you're writing something or et cetera. And that can be easier if you have it, uh, if you have two things in front of you at the same time, rather than dealing with two separate devices and trying to do it that way. So if we do go towards a mobile first model, um, I would hope that we don't cut off people's ability to still use it on a desktop system. I think just super quickly from from my perspective, I think um, it. I think from a, a reshare or a folio perspective, I think it would be highly desirable to try to have the delivery mechanism abstracted away, so that because I think that the type of platform that you choose for delivery would probably be tied to the overall patron experience that you want to provide. So having some mechanism or thinking about the interface layers between the library management system and your your discovery mechanism and the, the, the actual sort of CDL delivery mechanism would be very useful to think about what would make it really easy to make these kind of drop in replaceable. The one thing we haven't addressed explicitly is that in CDL you are replicating the reading experience so you're limited by the physical uh, the book the properties of the book. Well, thank you all so much for the presentation. Unfortunately, we are out of time, um, <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. And thank you to all the attendees. Um, uh, we'll start up again for our final day of WolfCon tomorrow morning at 9.30 Eastern um, and with a presentation from the Advanced Research Consortium about their OLF project. So uh, again, thank you to our panelists today and um, all of the attendees. So thank you.